to start the introduction with my camera on um, so you guys can like, you know, get to know me a bit more. Um, and then I've put together a little presentation. Okay, there we go. Um, so first off, can everyone hear me okay? I am in the gallery right now and the um, it's a little bit echoey. So if the audio is like really crap, then let me know and I will like relocate to somewhere else in the gallery. But here's, I'm in the meeting room. It's um, nice and quiet. So yeah, um, awesome. So today I'm going to be talking to you guys about gallery structures. Um, and I mean gallery structures in a kind of very traditional art gallery sense. Um, so first of all, I just want to introduce myself a little bit. So my name is India. Um, I currently live in London and work in London. Um, I got into specifically the history of art um, when I was at like 15, I studied um, in Rome for a year and I fell in love with art history um, and felt like I was in this really weird kind of like dichotomy of um, loving art but not really being good at making anything with my hands or, you know, things like that. I was always creative with like photography, um, things like that, but I was always much more of a kind of a person who loved to learn about art and write about it. Um, so that's how I got into the history of art. And um, I started off with doing an internship when I was 16 um, at Christie's Auction House. Uh, it was like a two-week work experience program in the 19th century pictures department. Um, I thought it was really boring and lame working with uh, dead artists. There were like a lot of maritime paintings and um, like hunting scenes. It was, an, it was a strange kind of department. Um, and then I went on to um, working for a Chinese contemporary ink art dealer. So that was my first time kind of getting into a really small faction of the art world. Um, it was two, no, it was a total of three members of staff, a relatively elderly man, uh, named Michael Goadhouse, who was a huge character, and he collected and dealed contemporary ink art. I was still like 17. I was like, wow, this is such a kind of um, strange and interesting world I'm delving into. So really small team, um, and that was like a couple weeks when I was uh, still a teenager. And then um, I decided 100% I want to study the history of art. Um, and I studied history of art at University College London, um, which is like just up the road from the gallery that I'm at now. Um, and I got the opportunity to do a sales internship at a really, really big gallery called David Swana. And I'm going to kind of get into a little like later on about like the types of galleries that are out there, but this is what we would call like a mega gallery. So with like, 300 staff members at all these different locations um, around the world. When I was a sales intern, it was very intense, very fast paced, um, but they deal with the contemporary art world. So that's why, where I was like, okay, I know what I want to do. Um, it was so much fun working in an exhibition space and also seeing the way sales works. Um, yeah, there you go. You guys are very proactive with the links. Um, so yeah, so there you can see it's kind of your your traditional big like blue chip gallery. Um, super intense, four months, and then I did my final year of university, and um, I specialized in the BLK art group of the 1980s, and specifically explored how um, black British artists were underrepresented in like the British art scene in the 80s with like this conservative Thatcherite government. So I got into a very political dissertation and also really explored the inequalities within the art world um, amongst that. I think that's part of what really appealed to me with Web3 is breaking down a lot of these inequalities, which we'll also get into. Um, so yeah, and then I, I graduated in the pandemic um, which was horrendous. I was like trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do with like my life? The art world is always super, super poorly affected when it comes to recession and, um, and uh, yeah, any type of like job crisis, uh, as you guys will probably understand as artists, um, you know, it's a competitive 
creative world out there. Um, so then randomly, uh, I had this opportunity that this gallery in Mayfair was um, hosting a virtual reality exhibition and they needed volunteers to clean headsets in between each visitor's um, each visitor's like visit. So that's what I did for like three months when I just graduated. I cleaned headsets in this gallery. Then they invited me to stay for an internship. And then in about January 2021, um, they offered me a full-time job as a digital assistant. I was like, okay, that's like interesting. It's a job, amazing. But my founder was like, we really want you to explore NFTs and we want you to specifically kind of develop the digital side of the gallery. Um, so that's how I started getting into kind of the new media side of the gallery that I work at now. Uh, so I run and kind of manage our own monthly residency program, which is also online. Um, and uh, I'm also a sales and artist liaison, but now I really specialize in new media and um, I also kind of spearheaded the gallery getting into the NFT scene. Um, so now I'm a couple years into working for this gallery. We're called Gazelli Art House. Um, if you guys, uh, I can also add the link in the chat if, that, if you want to see what it's like. Um, so yeah, so I started working for Gazelli Art House and that's where I am today. And uh, we are kind of what you would call like a medium sized gallery. So we've got about eight members of staff. Um, we've got two locations in central London and in Baku. And we're a relatively young gallery. Um, our amazing founder, Mila Askarova, founded the gallery about 10 years ago. Um, the way that she started the gallery is she initially was doing pop-ups all around London. And uh, then she found a permanent space. And that's kind of how we've been functioning ever since. Um, also, to give a bit of context before we get into like the presentation, the gallery that I work for um, not only are we young, we're also known as kind of like very experimental in like sometimes in the, in this like neighborhood in London, you've got all of the traditional art galleries in Mayfair pretty much. Um, so, you know, we started doing virtual reality exhibitions like six years ago annually, and people were kind of like, oh, this is very strange and interesting. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty progressive program always had a strong interest in kind of advocacy for new media. Um, and yeah, I'm so happy to be able to work in the, um, the gallery world, but also, you know, be able to explore what I think is the like most exciting art movement going on right now. And that's, you know, digital art and web three. Um, so yeah, let me, I hope, I hope I didn't go too fast. And um, for anyone who's just joined, I just gave, a little bit of background on, on um, my work so far. Um, so you could still say I'm very much like earlier on in my career, um, but uh, I'm learning new things every day and uh, I've like definitely had my toes in a bunch of different facets of the traditional art world. And uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's a really exciting scene. Um, cool, so I'm going to, turn off camera and then I'm going to put on my presentation. Okay. There we go. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Wait, okay. Yes, okay, cool. So I'm going to keep it full screen then. Cool. Okay. So I can't I can't see your chat right now, but I'll kind of go back and forth, I guess, to uh, to double checking, like, and, and seeing if you guys have any questions so far. Um, first off, I want to say huge congratulations to uh, kind of uh, joining the residency program um, with Vertical Crypto Art. I think you know that you guys are doing the exactly the right things as you kind of progress and learn as artists. Um, I know that me 
Nicole puts on such like a, and Boya put on an amazing program. Um, and yeah, you guys are in uh, amazing hands and I'm so happy to be invited to teach you guys. It's, uh, it's really exciting and I'm super passionate about this. Um, so a few clarifications before we get into gallery structures. Um, I just kind of want you to know that I'll be discussing traditional gallery structures very much based off my own interpretation and like kind of what um, the traditional art world would consider like the gallery's main functions are. I of course don't know any of your personal experiences with galleries just yet, so I'm not speaking like, like you're not a gallery if, if you do things this way or that way. I'm speaking in like pretty general terms when I go through this. Um, so my notes keep in mind are from both research and my own like personal experience and also just kind of like the basics of the art world. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, one sec guys, I'm just gonna pull up the chat on my phone because I think that will be more productive. Uh -huh. Okay, bear with me. The chat on my phone, cool, okay. So things that I want to kind of cover today. Um, so specifically what an art gallery is, because definition wise, it's, it's very kind of loose. Um, the role of the art gallery within the art world ecosystem. So, you know, I'm, I'm not super sure on you, you, all of your levels of involvement or knowledge of, of the way that the art world works generally. Um, but I think that there's like very much of a mystification of what an art gallery actually does compared to like an auction house and an art dealer and a private institution and a public collection. Like what do all of these things mean? It's really confusing and it's hard to navigate. And I think it's also especially hard to navigate as an artist. Um, so it's important to kind of know some of the basics. Um, and, then, and then you've also got types of contemporary art galleries which we'll delve into so what kind of business models um, various contemporary galleries have with artists nowadays um, and then I'll go into the roles within traditional commercial art galleries so like all of the things that we do as a team be it you know marketing registrar the legality of things you know dealing with cultural um, property and uh, you know objects of value is, is extremely uh is a, is a very fragile and interesting kind of industry. Um, so, and then also we'll go into, you know, exactly how, as an artist, do you even approach an art gallery? Like art galleries come off as so intimidating and unwelcoming sometimes, and like, it's not okay. And that definitely needs to change, but we can kind of delve into like how you start conversations. Um, with gallerists and those people at the front desk. Um, and then we can also break down to what, what our relationship actually looks like with an artist and a gallery. Like, what does it mean? What are some of the kind of ways that you benefit each other? How do you maintain a healthy relationship? Um, so yeah, and then of course, we'll get into kind of the way that galleries are changing for the better. Um, yeah, and then of course, questions. So I've created two definitions. So this is like my definition. And then I just pulled the one from Wikipedia. So the first one, an art gallery is an exhibition space for the display and sale of artworks. As a result, the art gallery is a commercial enterprise working with a portfolio of artists in which a gallery acts as the dealer and ambassador, representing, supporting, and distributing artworks by artists, potentially and hopefully, for an extended period of time throughout their career. Okay, so an art gallery, um, anyone can have an art gallery, anyone can be like, oh, come and look at my art gallery. It's not like that's inaccurate, but when, you know, when you're reading the art newspaper or, you know, all of these like various art worldy based texts when they refer to a commercial art gallery or an art gallery they tend to be referring to galleries in this sense um so yeah that's kind of like what i would say is this a semi uh universal understanding within the art world um 
but of course, you know, this is from Wikipedia. Both both of these both of these terms for like art museum and art gallery are used interchangeably. Um, so yeah, some and you know equally a lot of spaces call themselves museums, but they're also selling the artworks, you know? So it's like, it, it can be a little bit confusing and muddy sometimes. Like, um, for example, the Fotografiska in uh, Sweden, I went there like a few weeks ago and it was like, I found out that their NFT exhibition is also like, it wasn't a permanent collection. They were also for sale, but they also brand themselves as a museum. So they've got like, you know, so you've got you've got spaces where there's not like it's not super defined. Um, but for the sake of this lesson, when I talk about art gallery, will it will generally be in like the commercial for sale type of sense. Um, oh, it's okay. So sorry, sorry, this part's really this looks really boring. <laughs> um, but I, I hope it's I hope it's not like that boring. I, if it's boring, maybe at least hopefully you will learn something. Um, so here is kind of like a scope of all the many different parts of the art world. I probably missed a couple of things, but this is kind of the general gist of, of the various facets that like I would deal with on a daily basis, other than the artist, of course, because you guys know what artists do. Um, so a museum and an institution, private collections, auction houses, art galleries, art dealers, advisories, and creative agencies. Now, um, just to be clear, a lot of these, um, a lot of these kind of spaces function similar roles. So let's kind of go through the top. So really interestingly. Um, the International Council of Museums just uh, like announced the official official description for a museum, which a museum is a non-for-profit permanent inst institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage open to the public, accessible and inclusive. Museums foster diversity and sustainability. They operate and communicate ethically, professionally, and with the participation of communities offering varied experiences for education, enjoyment, reflection, and knowledge sharing. So that's now the official description of a museum. So not for sale, um, all about knowledge and learning, things like this. Now a private collection um, is something owned by like like huge, huge companies. And you guys probably could go into a lot of museums thinking that they're like public institutions, but they're actually backed by like huge financial backers. And equally museums are very frequently funded by like huge companies and corporations. That's why you've got like certain wings of museums named after, you know, various um, like pharmaceutical companies, which has caused scandal. Um, so yeah, you can see how there's already a little bit of crossover, um, but private collections equally could also act as dealers and they also will lend works to institutions and things like this. Um, private collections very frequently will be in like a really nice house um, or, you know, the company will buy like a huge building and it could operate as a museum or you would specifically have to like request an appointment, um, which is the case of a lot of specifically like US private collections. Um, so yeah, and then you've got auction houses. So auction houses is a company that runs uh, auctions of objects and artworks um, and now digital assets. Um, keep in mind auction houses do function both on the primary and secondary market. Um, just to be clear in case like, I'm sure you guys already know, but primary market things that are sold directly like from it's like the first sale of an artwork secondary market would be after the work has been sold so if that makes sense um so yeah those are those are auction houses and through kind of um private sale auction houses will really function quite similarly to art galleries or art dealers um so you can see how there's already like a crossover there um and then art galleries commercial enterprise managing frequently primary sales and also occasionally secondary sales of artworks 
um, keeping here curated exhibition program for the majority um, or for, for a specific type of gallery, curated exhibition program, and uh, this kind of management slash representation of an artist's career. So, um, so yeah, things, things kind of like that, which we'll delve into exactly what that means, because uh, I know sometimes it doesn't sound very appealing to a lot of people in the uh, uh, digital art space. Um, but I personally think it's kind of one of the, the most fun parts of it is working with artists really long term. Um, so then we've got art dealers. So art dealers um, are people who will like buy, frequently buy artworks and then flip it and then sell it for much higher. Um, art dealers are also very frequently specialists and they're very frequently secondary, or they're almost always secondary market. Um, they, art dealers tend to be like much smaller than, than a large scale gallery um, but keep in mind that like if you google art dealers and art gallerists are very typically like described as the same thing so if you google some of these names like like it would be like Larry Gagosian art dealer I think rather than gallerist so that gets a little bit confusing but by nature um, gallerists are kind of dealers and dealers are, yeah I, I don't know if that doesn't make sense uh, ask in the questions but I hope it does a little bit the difference between an art dealer is that they aren't committed to creating like an official kind of um gallery program the way that an art gallery like is really set to do so a curated program of exhibitions every six weeks um they're not they wouldn't be as kind of glued to that by definition that's the way I would interpret it um so yeah and then you've also got advisories and creative agencies which is really interesting because I'm seeing a lot more digital artists um and kind of like fellow friends just entering into um agency practice so where you would work more on a project by project basis with an agent um they'll work a lot like across creative industries with like music and film and influences more kind of brand based deals so an art gallery um really is super focused on the art world so we're really like focused on um, museums uh, private collections um, various biennales, art fairs, so very art focused, um, whereas a lot of advisories and creative agencies might have more tools outside of the art world, which is also, depending on what kind of artist you are, could be like a 10 times better fit for you compared to an art gallery. Um, so yeah, so pretty, pretty interesting there. Okay, now... We are going to get into the history of the modern art gallery. Um, I'm just going to take a sip of water. I, is this, um, am I, can you guys tell me if I'm talking too quickly? Oh, and if you can hear me, okay. We can hear you, okay. Okay, great. Um, ad, ad, so should we include advertising in traditional promotional and representational galleries? Well, that's a very interesting question, um, which I actually want to get back to on the on a slightly later slide. I think after this one, types of galleries. So I'm going to get to that. I'll get to that question. Um, but yeah, okay. So this is what I've like really geeked out on for this lesson. So the history of the modern art gallery. So... Exhibitions of art basically operated similar to current galleries for marketing art um, that appeared in like the early modern period. Uh, in the Middle Ages, that kind of preceded painters and sculptors were members of guilds um, seeking commissions to produce artworks for aristocratic patrons or churches. Um, hence kind of what you see a lot in the you know medieval periods is portraits of rich people and Jesus. That's kind of like the bulk. And then like we get into still lives and things like this. But it was always a kind of demonstration of wealth for the person who was, you know, um, who was commissioning the artist to create something. Right. So not really kind of like creative freedom that we have today in a way. Um, so commercial art galleries were pretty well established by like the Victorian era. 
Um, and that was really made possible by the increasing number of people seeking to own like objects of cultural and I guess like aesthetic value. Um, but that was really dictated by the Parisian salons. So the Parisian salon um, very much kind of was the, a space that was like the acceptable art uh, in the Victorian era and kind of declared value, um, which kind of leads us to our first early kind of model of a gallerist. So Paul Durand Ruel uh, from Paris, he is known as the guy who championed the Impressionists before it was cool. So with the Impressionists, we've got like Monet, Pissarro, Renoir, things like that. Um, so all of those guys, despite their extreme high value now, were very much rejected, um, you know, when they started, which is part of what made them so famous. So he is known for kind of modernizing the art market, um, and he's kind of considered to be one of the most important art dealers of the 19th century. So um, he kind of based his... Uh, professional philosophy of collecting, dealing, and supporting artists based on a few uh, key principles. So his uh, principles were to protect and defend art above all else. He believed in the exclusivity of the artist's production. So that's kind of an early example of where you've got someone who wants to exclusively um, look after an artist's career and really bring them to, in his case, like the Parisian aristocracy. So he would want to kind of be that person to, to share like all of these impressionists artworks to the world, if that makes sense. He believed in individual solo exhibitions. So the thing about the Parisian salon is it would be gr group exhibitions of artists stacked on top of each other. He didn't believe that was like a very productive way to show an artist's, you know, full, full um, level of scale. He believed in solo shows, which is extremely crucial to an artist's career. Um, he believed in a network of interna international galleries. Um, so from, from Paris to New York, he also did some work in Germany. So he believed in bringing art kind of around internationally. Um, he believed in free access to his galleries and to his apartment. So he was pretty modern for, for kind of being that way. Um, and he also, his final point was to associate the art world with the finance world. So he did have his kind of, you know, very um, art dealer money, money initiative kind of um, vibe to him in the sense that he understood these objects as, you know, value. Um, so, yeah. And then he would take a cut from the sales, of course. That's how he kind of, um, that's how he, you know, made his money. And then uh, he did solo exhibitions and he actually also managed artists on stipends, which is fascinating because then you've got Peggy Guggenheim and then Leo Castelli who do, do the same models. But you'll see, you know, throughout art history, a lot of really like um, a lot of dealers and a lot of gallerists do literally, you know, provide um, like a salary for artists to just create their artwork. I don't think it's as frequent now or you might have to. To, you might have to really like look for it but this is a pretty nice um a nice model that he was at the forefront of um so another fun fact about him is that he even framed impressionist artworks in 18th century frames just to try to elevate them and to teach the audience that like okay but look at this artwork in this old frame like now you can see the level of how amazing it is so you know he really it, it was it was not it's not easy to to push an art movement that isn't accepted by the masses as we all know like even working in the digital art space um so you know these these guys although they're super rich and privileged they they really um you know they, they did something which is which is great okay and then we have peggy guggenheim um so I actually forgot to mention this in my introduction. So I actually interned for the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice um, for a couple months, which was a really cool experience. So that was actually my experience, like really getting into what it's like to um, work in a museum, to work with older art. So Peggy was a major character also super bourgeois, comes from um, like a really wealthy kind of factory family. 
um, who had like a bunch of steel mines. And then she, in her 20s, decides to up it and move to Paris. And then she becomes friends with all of like the Bohemians in the 1920s in Paris. And she just like falls in love with the art world. Um, she meets her husband, Lawrence Vale, when she's working for a bookshop reading about like Bohemian movements and things like that. Um, and then she's like, oh my God, I, I want to be a gallerist. So she's already kind of like paying, um, she's already buying works by Picasso, Alexander Calder, um, like, gosh, like loads of cubists and surrealists, Dali, like you name it, her, her collection is worth millions and millions now, but she was buying it for really cheap. Um, so when she when she fled Paris during the Second World War, she like bought like so much art to try and kind of um, flee the Nazis. So she took her collection to uh, London, or maybe this was in the 30s. Actually, I think this was the 30s. Sorry, I'm brushing up on my history here. This was in the 30s before she fled to New York. Um, but yeah, so she decided to open a art gallery and she was like, oh, it would be so easy to sell like works by um, various cubists and, you know, like just to also very kind of abstract artists at that time. I think she did her first like retrospective of a solo show of Kandinsky and like not a single work of art sold um, in London. So she's like, oh my God, she's, she thought it was really hard to sell art as a, as a gallerist, um, which it is. Uh, and she just kind of decided, you know, sod this I'm not going to be a gallerist I will just be a museum it's she'd rather kind of just buy the works permanently um she even uh when she didn't sell artworks by some of the artists she um would famously bought by them without the artist knowing so she would tell the artist like oh yeah it's sold but but really she was just buying it um because she felt bad so that's kind of cute but yeah so another example of a um a gallerist slash dealer who, um, you know, who really championed artists who are super emerging. Um, and I think it's pretty inspiring. Um, and then we go to, yeah, exactly. And of course she bankrolled Jackson Pollock, um, which was like pretty fantastic. Um, so that you can see kind of a little bit of a continuation from Paul de Ruel, Peggy Guggenheim. And then we go on to Leo Castelli, um, and he is uh, super famous for um, his support of abstract expressionist and pop artist. So uh, his first kind of American curatorial effort was with this show called Ninth Street in 1951, which was all abstract expressionism. Um, he then partnered with a gallerist named Sidney Janist. Um, and then in 1957, he officially opened his own gallery called the Leo Caselli Gallery. And then... Um, yeah, and then he, he he really kind of supported artists like um, everyone from Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Cy Twombly, um, Norman Blum, and Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns. You can see that great picture of him there. Um, so, yeah, so Leo Castelli really spearheaded a kind of systematic approach to running his business where previous dealers were a little bit more, like, purely transactional. Castelli really recognised a potential for um, interpersonal growth between us to kind of like follow an artist with their career. So rather than following an antiquated system where galleries would profit 50-50, he cultivated methods to creatively nurture his artist roster. Um, and really like he's known for his kind of like strong loyalty. Um, so now he's like known as the kind of Leo Castelli model, which is this gallery model that's founded on mutual trust and respect, which is great. Um, he even gave uh, artists uh, stipends as well, notwithstanding their, their sales. Um, and he also became the first to postulate what is now acclaimed as like a fundamental commercial consummation of the notion of an artist as a marketable brand, which is kind of where we're at today. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope that wasn't too too much. Okay, here's here's like just a just a kind of like fun 
fun thing that Peggy Guggenheim did. Um, so when she opened her like permanent museum, so after she quit kind of trying to sell uh, artworks commercially, she opened Art of the Century in New York in like the late 40s. And you can see just like how purely experimental she was with her modes of display. She literally hung, hung these um, paintings so you could see the back of the canvases and you could rotate them around. And yeah, so, so a lot of these... Um, early dealers and gallerists are like just as kind of creative and 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 you know a little bit strange and um have really interesting lives and um yeah so that's that's a, a nice picture of uh, peggy's little museum um okay so types of galleries today so this gallery here in the middle is um is uh, the is my gallery is that the art house so there we are we've got these big beautiful windows um so yeah shout out to to all the gallery um so let's talk about the types of galleries so i actually learned quite a lot when i researched types of galleries i learned some new things um so let's start with a mega gallery so we're like as you know the link previously before David's Werner is an example of a mega gallery you've also got like Gagosian and Hauser and Worth um, Pace is very big so these galleries tend to have like anywhere from like three to even like nine locations and they're always in like the center of a really big city um usually in like the most prominent arts district or like a really wealthy district um they you know also have a curated program um but they you know they're known to really go after artists who who um are suddenly like earning loads and loads of money or are getting in the press so artists who already are like pretty you know what we would call established so perhaps they already have had a team working behind them they're earning you know on the auctions these galleries are noticing oh this contemporary artist is selling for six digits or even like late set like uh, high high seven digits um it's typically like things like this which will make a a kind of big gallery want to work with an artist so they're very like um they're very like PR and sales driven as is all as are all galleries uh in in, in their own right because it's how it's how they um it's the business model but but yeah it's it's pretty big name artists that they're working with um and also the people who kind of run and manage these galleries really tend to be extremely influential in the art world. So a lot of these um, gallery directors will also be sitting on museum boards, will also be on submission boards of art fairs. Um, you know, they'll have really big teams of up to like 300 to like, like even 500 people worldwide. Um, so they're really like, they're not this kind of, you know, small, quaint kind of the way the way you would think of like a nice little art gallery. They're 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 really big kind of powerhouses that churn in loads of money. Um, so that's a kind of mega gallery, right? And then you've got more of like a, I guess like your bog standard commercial art gallery. So you might have one to to let's say three locations, um, like and that's still getting pretty big. Um, you've also got. Uh, You'll have like a team of anywhere from two people or even one person to a team of like, you know, 15, I guess, or 20, um, really depending. Um, and you'll have a curatorial program, um, but you will have, you know, certain artists that you represent. Oh, sorry, guys. Put that on silent. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the, so that would be the gallery that I work for. So we're a team of I get, I think like 15 total, if you include the other uh, location in Baku. So we're pretty, um, pretty tight, tight knit, pretty small group. Um, only eight of us here in London. And we represent around 20 artists. Um, and uh, the types of artists that galleries represent uh, really, really depends. You'll sometimes see like a really broad variation. And then you'll see also some galleries like, you know, perhaps only, only work 
and represent women artists. Like my friend works for Mother Gallery in New York, which is only dedicated to women artists. Um, other galleries will have like certain regional focus focuses. Um, so yeah, it really, it really kind of depends on every gallery is kind of different in, in some way. Um, and okay, so this is what I learned about, which is new to me. So, and I like spoke with, um, with some like friends about it in the art world. Like I was, I couldn't believe this was real. So you guys should be wary of this, of a vanity gallery. Um, so these guys will basically invite artists to um, exhibit in their, their space but they will charge the artist a fee, um, which is not the way that commercial art galleries work. So like we would like, I would never, I've never heard of a gallery to, to like ask for an artist for money to promote their artwork and exhibit their artwork. It's not really how it works. When galleries like work with an artist, um, it's because you believe in their artwork. You believe like commercially it will do well, press wise it will do well. You want to show it to, you know, your your kind of network that you've created of your gallery. So um, it should never like a gallery shouldn't really be asking for you to necessarily um, be like paying paying for that. It's 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 not the point in my opinion. Although I'm sure this business model does work, but I think, yeah, just to keep in mind, um, tr yeah, I, I mean, you shouldn't really have to pay, but I don't know, but also, I don't because I'm reading you guys' message now, if Super Rare does that, I'm sure it's totally fine, but but um, as your career progresses, I'm sure you'll, like, get opportunities to, um, to exhibit without having to pay a fee nor should you have to if someone if a gallerist genuinely loves your work so yeah uh, okay and then you've got shops so i wanted to include like exhibition spaces and shops oh and artist led galleries i'll get to that in a sec so shops um a lot of like like traditional kind of galleries um not sorry not traditional galleries but galleries in all around cities like galleries are everywhere exhibition spaces are everywhere like we should cover our towns with art for sure um it's a good way to make money if you kind of put your prints of your work in a museum bookshop or if you submit some kind of paintings to um like some coffee shop galleries i know there are some very cool ones in east london um but perhaps if you're like looking to go into a traditional art gallery like you wouldn't you don't really need to add that you had your prints being sold at a certain store or anything you should try and keep it as like curatorially focused as possible um but a good but it's good to uh, to get some money basically um especially as you're just starting out of course um then we've got artist-led galleries, which is really cool. So this is also something um, that I recently learned about. Um, so the past few decades, there have been a few like success stories of artist-run galleries, um, something called the Galleria Plan B from Berlin. Um, and uh, yeah, so in this case, like, an, like artists or artist collectives, um, start up a gallery or exhibition space of their own and I was researching them and I saw that like they're now they like participate in art fairs and yeah so you know the ways that galleries can start doesn't necessarily need to be from a huge financial backer or a um you know you don't need loads of money necessarily uh you could just start collectively and, and grow and, and you know there's no like set in stone model um but yeah these are kind of some of the various types of galleries uh that are present right now Okay, now I want to get into roles. I'm just going to have another sip of water. Sorry. So another thing I forgot to mention about like my, um, like my art world kind of uh, experience was after, so I told you guys how um, like I graduated like in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. So that means in my third year of university, um, 
I, it was like the pandemic and during my internship at David Zwana, I actually became very close with one of the directors of David Zwana books. And whilst I was living with her, because I was nannying for her kids, um, whilst I was finishing up my degree, we became like quite friendly. So that's kind of a, a cute, cute story. And I was watching her um, create the next book for David Zwana books. Um, which was called, which was the first like, children's book called How to Create an Exhibition, which was really cute because I think like, um, especially kids, and I think that like the majority of my friends don't really know what you do in an art gallery and what it takes to put on an exhibition. So I thought I would include this nice kind of um, illustration of all of the different things that uh, like, you know, all of the different parts of an art gallery or a museum um, really kind of look after. So you've got your museum director taking charge of the museum. You've got your art handlers who are extremely, extremely well trained and skilled with dealing these art, dealing with these artworks. You've got a registrar who also will deal with like the legalities and all of the shipping and taxation laws. That is like extremely complicated. Like. They, you have to have a lot of patience to be a registrar. You've got someone who manages events, which is extremely crucial to um, nurture this like physical relationship that that's so like integral to the art world, um, like generally, and to the gallery. I mean, as a gallery, we host so many events every month. <laughs> it's pretty exhausting, but very fun. Um, and then you've got like the communications manager dealing with all of the PR and social media and, you know, trying to get their artists and their exhibitions and the exhibitions into the press is super, super important. Um, and uh, I get educators a bit more kind of towards the museum side of things, but we've definitely done events with kids. Uh, which has been quite nice, and a conservator. Um, God, I can't tell you guys how many times artworks have come into the gallery and have been like, like a little bit damaged or like something isn't working. It's just um, very, very important to uh, work with conservators. And um, equally, oh, development director. Um, that is also a little bit more of a museum role. So. A, develop, a de head of development at a gallery might be more like business partnerships, like working with brands and working with um, uh, like external kind of um, institutions, things like that. So, so more like developing the business of the gallery, if that makes sense. Um, and then you've got a museum guard, which I've also done a lot of in my time, um, which is where you get to stand next to the artwork. I did that at the Peggy Guggenheim for four hours a day, and it was very, it was very interesting, but kind of nice at the same time. Um, okay, roles in art gallery in a little bit more detail. Um, so I tried to like map out all the little facets. So like you've got your sales side. So sales directors will also very frequently be curators. Um, it's important within the gallery program and for the gallery to stay alive that the artists that you're working with uh, have like a healthy market. So, so both parties are, you know, earning, earning, um, are selling in the exhibitions ideally. And then you've got um, exhibitions and production. So artist liaison is also can tie along with them um, with like a sales role. So for example, in in my gallery, I am the artist liaison for like four artists and I will have meetings with them every week and we'll just talk about like opportunities that they've got coming up or like plan about, plan the next artworks, talk about sales, like talk about their price points, talk about museum opportunities, partnerships, like so many, so many things. Um, so it's a really, it's, it's probably like the most important relationship is um, that contact with, with the artists that you're working with. Um, also, just to kind of clarify, as much as, you know, a commercial art gallery, it's important that you make sales, you've got two clientele that you're dealing with. As an artist, you do not work for an art gallery. Like, you, the gallery works, should be working for you in a way. So they should be supporting you um, 
So keep keep that in mind, uh, just just in like the future. And um, you've also got your collectors. So so it's like you're 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 trying to nurture two different relationships. Um, but I think frequently the artists don't realize that they you know the gallery wants to look after you. Um, so yeah, just wanted to make that clear. Then of course you've got. As I said, um, art handlers, registrar. Then you've got your PR and marketing. Now for the, like super big blue chip galleries, you've got like um, many different levels of uh, social media and marketing teams. Um, and you know PR and marketing, as you guys especially know in like the Web three space, is you know very frequently like make or break in terms of making your artwork commercially successful. Um, it's the same case in like the traditional art world that to make sure that you know your exhibitions are getting good press um, super important and then you've got external projects so this is I think a lot of the things that um, the the kind of like people don't really see that art galleries do but with every single artwork that's in a museum or in a private collection um or a public collection for that matter there's been like a gallery typically it's like typically i'm saying generally there's been a gallery that's been trying to in initiate these conversations so like the amount of time that that as a gallery we're spending talking to curators talking to curators about the about our artists artworks and being like look at this artwork like it would be amazing to contextualize this in the Victoria and Albert Museum print section. This is integral for your, you know, for the museum's representation of non-binary portraiture, so th things like this. So a lot of um, sales is also to museums and institutions um, and these kind of, you know, external exhibition spaces, because as a gallery, it's like super, super important that our artists' artworks are in museums and can be seen till till the end of time. I think that's like something that that um, art galleries are pretty like religious about um, is is just the visibility of of their artists' artworks in the physical space. So yeah, that's that. And then you've got like internal management, so gallery assistants, people at the front desk, calling people, coming down, having meetings. Um, and then you've got research, super, super important research. Um, you know, the amount of learning um, that goes into when you work in an art gallery is uh, like every day. And I think that's part of what makes it so much fun is I'm still learning the history of art. And right, and you know, the past year I've been learning about the history of the blockchain, crazy. And then I've been learning about the history of uh, and, and, you know, what's going on in even the future and, like, the developments of, of what's happening right now. So you're constantly, like, consuming information and trying to analyse the market, trying to um, contextualise artworks within, like, an art historical canon or, yeah, you're constantly researching. Um, sorry, I'm, like, flabbling quite, quite a lot, but I know I need to slow down a little bit. Oh, also... Publishing. So also mega galleries, as I mentioned where this is from. So this is from David's Werner Books. Um, a lot of really big galleries will do um, publishing, which is great. So our gallery has also done it for certain exhibitions um, where we will put together like an official book. Um, that like commemorates the exhibition. We will invite curators to write curatorial texts about the exhibition. And then like, I remember one of my first jobs as an intern when I got here was to, um, to try to send, um, send these books to like various libraries all around England. And I can like proudly say that now our, our uh, Ninth Street catalog from 2019, I believe, is in um, like the National Art Library. It's in uh, the Oxford Art Library, all these things. And that's also really important for us that now, you know, students who are learning um, about, uh, you know, the history of art or any artists who are learning, they'll be able to look at these catalogs that we made and see the artists that we've worked with who we really believed in. And 
you know, we've, we've, we're doing that for our digital artists quite soon as well, um, after our kind of six years of working with them. So, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of kind of, um, I hope that was like a little bit, gives you some clarification on, on the various roles that we're doing. Um, and then one more thing, secondary market specialist. Um, and that's when galleries manage an artist estates. So this is pretty, just briefly, um, an artist estate is when an artist dies and then um, basically a gallery uh, will ask, you know, the, the inheritors of that estate if they can like manage the inventory um, of that artist. So for example, we represent the estate of Harold Cohen quite newly. He only passed away um, like five years ago, uh, but it's a new representation. Um, he's a really early gener generative artist. He built robots in Berkeley in the uh, in the late '60s and '70s, and uh, um, yeah, and then he like taught the artist to, I mean, the robot to paint on canvas, which was pretty cool. Uh, so we manage his estate, and we're putting on like a retrospective of all of his works. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how we're working with an artist who has, um, has passed. Yes, I will link his name now. He's very cool. Um, oh, there we go. So he's like collected by the Tate. He's pretty established, but he actually isn't very much acknowledged in um, the traditional, like the traditional art world, hardly at all. Um, but yeah, so you guys can have a look at his work and it's pretty cool. Um, where were we? Yeah, do you? Okay. So yeah, that's roles. Um, now keep in mind when you're like also so many galleries do not have these many individual roles. There was a time where I was doing the PR and marketing for all digital artists. I was doing the sales. I was doing partnerships with NFT platforms. I was doing like 10 different roles. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Oh, thanks. That means a lot. Amazing. So yeah, so it's like, you know, so many galleries do not have that many people um, at all. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, abnormal to have like a huge, huge team other than like the mega galleries and stuff. But the benefit of working in a slightly smaller gallery is the amount of like responsibility and you know direct interaction you get to have with curators and artists and collectors. You don't really get that type of um, leeway when you're in like a very large scale gallery, of course. Okay, and now um, we're going to get into how to approach and introduce yourself to an art gallery. Gosh, okay, so. I also feel like I've been there in the sense that, I mean, I was looking for a job. It's kind of like the same thing when you go as an artist into a gallery, you're like really trying to sell yourself and you're trying to sell your practice and that's not an easy thing to do. So I'll start with the don'ts. So my advice, don't, oh wait, actually no, let's start with step one. Okay, first research. You guys all have so much value and your work is probably, well, I'm sure is extremely, you know, specific and well thought How Make sure you find an art gallery that suits, you know, the work that you're creating. You, you want to make sure that these are your people, you know, um, they need to be able to understand your work. Equally, don't even bother trying to approach an art gallery that's like specializing in, you know, maritime paintings um, or like seascapes from the 1800s. Like, don't even, don't even try <laughs> because they won't like, like it's like they're they're a totally different market, you know. So know your audience. Um, it would be easy to go into every single gallery that you see and try and pitch, but if you want to be more productive, try to. Uh, do some research and really find the ones that you want to have a relationship with. Um, so after you've done your research, um, look on their website. If they say we don't accept unsolicited submissions, I wouldn't like don't don't send it anyways. Um, and 
it's like don't be too pushy as well it's like we're trying to get people who work in galleries are trying to get on with their day-to-day office stuff so it's um it's it's very frequently like not in the discretion of the person um who is like at the front desk or you know at um yeah who's at a junior level um to accept new artists it's like much kind of a more senior kind of thing to do now what I would do is introduce yourself in person at a time that isn't busy and ask for friendly advice so just have a chat with someone um if they seem really preoccupied don't get offended um great to go to openings check out their network like really see if this is the kind of place that you want to be because let's say you do start working with them you want to have a great opening you want them to you know invite interesting people and you know you want to you want it to be well attended you want to make sure that you've got the visibility um a really great way to also get integrated within like an art gallery's network is actually to become friendly with um the represented or exhibited artists that the gallery works with so interestingly um I don't know if it's like a good or a bad thing. Um, Gazelli Art House, like, and Gazelli specifically, the residency program that I kind of manage, we have a lot, a lot of artists who are like friends with each other and all know each other, a lot of digital artists. I feel like it's a tight knit community, anyways. But we really do take seriously our, the artists that we've worked with. We take seriously their like advice and interest. Um, so, when I get a recommendation from an artist that I work with, I'll, I'll very much like take it on board and have a look and, you know, because you trust, you trust the artists that you're working with because they're really entrenched in like the scene and, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's important to have a, it's, it's definitely helpful to have a little bit of a network with, with creatives um, that the gallery works with, if that's like really your approach. Um, and then, yep, yeah, use, use social media to your advantage. I'm sure you guys are all super good at this. Um, yeah, so, you know, continue to share your work. Um, I, think, I think it's difficult, like, as an artist as well, because it's like, you, it feels like you kind of can't be an introvert sometimes, which I know must be extremely difficult being a creative and always feeling like you've got to put yourself out there. I'll definitely talk about the residency a bit towards towards the end. I'll like I'll go through this quite quickly. Um, and yeah, so so I know it's like quite hard to always be putting yourself out there, but it is kind of a very important. It's an important factor of being a being an artist. Um, just because also the traditional art world is so physical and so present. Um, but yeah, equally, start local, start in your community. If you don't live in a big city, don't worry. Um, the opportunities will come. Um, and equally, if you have any other questions, you guys can um, email me or DM me after this. So now we'll get into the relationships. This is like the final thing pretty much, yeah. Um, and then hope, and then we'll have like 10 minutes. So, okay, now let's say you have, oh great, you found a gallery and you guys like are getting on um, swimmingly and it's getting to quite serious talking phases of um, exhibitions and potentially representation. So the first tip I would say is take it slow when you're starting conversations with galleries You'll always have an exhibition or typically be a part of a group exhibition or do a residency if the gallery is associated with that before you get into like official, like putting on an exhibition type of thing. Um, So the nature of the relationship, um, the art world is a notoriously kind of social environment. As I said, it's punctuated by parties and private events and um, international travel you know all super exciting um so there's a little bit of territory where you could be super friendly with uh galleries and to the point of like you know you need to make sure that there are boundaries and 
that tends to be a strain of like money and emotions because it's your artwork. It's like your, you know, it's like your child when you've got a body of artwork in, in a gallery space, but there's also money involved. Um, so that's why you'll see like quite a lot of drama and gossip on, on quite a lot of like art publications. Um, specifically, if like an artist and a gallery fall out or they no longer represent each other, that tends to be covered in the press. Um, so yeah, just always making sure that relationships are professional and um, calm and just understanding of, of you know, how, how each person is, is sustaining themselves. Um, believe in your work. Um, that's your most important thing is to always make sure that you're, um, you know, working creatively and, and your work speaks to you. If you're in a gallery relationship and, and you're not selling and you feel like they might... Um, you know, they might not want to, they might want to no longer represent you. Um, understanding that that's not all about like your worth as an artist, sales isn't everything, you know, um, keep that in mind for sure. Um, also the art world can sometimes seem like a little bit of a cynical place, one in which like dealers kind of circulate, uh, and like kind of seem like money hungry sharks. Um, will run into people who are like social climbing or you'll like start let's say you've had like a huge sale I think this happened quite a lot in the NFT world artists making huge sales and then galleries approaching them asking for representation and then I've heard some artists who like we work with who have been like they have absolutely no idea about what my work is about they just wanted to start this conversation because I made you know some like because of this sale you know so so be be wary of that um I'm sure you guys all use your best judgment um yeah always making sure that like the that the gallery's understanding of your work is really sincere and uh, keep that in mind because they're going to be communicating your message when you know you're not going to be at the gallery every day so super important um be transparent um be super transparent, be transparent about what you expect from commission structures. If you don't feel like 50-50 is fair, you can negotiate, talk talk to them about it. Um, typically, like, artist and gallery relationships are so strong that you can have these, like, really frank conversations. So, so like, you shouldn't be working with a gallery that makes you feel like you need to, like, they need to take a crazy commission or anything. It's, it's all about having a healthy relationship. Um, a lot of people compare like representations and things to like marriages, but, and I do think it is a little bit like that, um, especially because galleries will get like really um, defensive over artists because, you know, you can work with them for such a long period of time um, and you can really watch like opportunities happen. You can travel the world with each other. You can, you know, do lots of really cool things with your gallery so it does get like a very um a very intense but equally like passionate kind of uh professional relationship um so i'm trying to see okay and then um more like logistical kind of boring things um again the galleries shouldn't charge a fee with the, um Galleries shouldn't charge a fee for representation um, or promotional activities. Not that shouldn't be necessary. Um, if a gallery wants to work with you and promote you, they shouldn't charge you. That's like crazy um, to me, at least. Um, the way a gallery earns money is through selling artworks to their clients, so it shouldn't be like. Nor should they charge you on a project by project basis. Like I would never. We would never ask an artist like, oh, we've got you a brand partnership with Gucci but you need to pay this amount it's not how it works um so yeah that would be more of like an agency basis I think um and then profits can be negotiated but the standard would be 50 50 sometimes it um changes to like way different but uh, for physical artworks it tends to be 50 50 um but with each as, as I mentioned like you can have these conversations super openly we have these conversations the whole time. Um, so yeah, so typically the artist is responsible for production costs. Um, 
and then the gallery is in charge of production costs for the exhibition. So your production costs would be, let's say, the AI system you paid to use to create the artwork or the screen that you really specifically wanted to use that you then shipped to the gallery. Um, and then in like the traditional sense, it would be, let's say, paint canvases, things like that. Um, that should be covered by the artist typically. And then the gallery should take care of repainting the walls, hanging the artworks, getting technicians in to install, things like that. Um, but sometimes this can be negotiated if it's specifically expensive. Um, there's been models where you could be like, okay, well, how about we deduct the production cost 50-50 when upon sale or something like that. So you take off that particular kind of financial burden, if that makes sense. Um, and then also, if you're represented by a gallery, you should also be have a pretty like active relationship. As as um, I mentioned, I speak with like the art my artists um, that we work with, like if not every day on WhatsApp, then then um, like you know once a week or once every couple of weeks if it's a little bit slow. Um, but yeah, you should really have an ongoing relationship. If you're represented, it shouldn't be just like oh, you have one exhibition and then, like, we don't talk to you for a long time. Like, they should really be helping you develop your, um, y yeah, like, your career in a really broad sense, hopefully. Um, and now we've got, like, the future. So this is the world that I've been immersed into. This is, like, you know, art galleries models are totally changing and been completely turned upside on its head. Um... Um, in like the recent couple of years, which I think is great because it means that, um, you know, we're holding a lot of art galleries more accountable for like things like, uh, you know, inequality and representation and ripping off artists and, and royalties. Oh my God. Like, and, and curatorial DAOs. I mean, I think all of this stuff is like so progressive and so exciting. And, uh, you know, we're at like a stage in the art world where, um, galleries still sometimes kind of stick their nose up at like these, at, um, you know, these NFT spaces and, uh, you know, these online curatorial spaces. Um, but, you know, I think things will slowly start to change and all of these companies really inspire me and um, definitely like the way that I work with artists um, in terms of fairness and, and listening and uh, I'm really excited to see how like the NFT space changes the art world to become, you know, an even more fair, fair space. So it's not just like, you know, the rich bourgeois who, who we talked about historically, who are like pushing and vouching for these artists, but it's, it's a much kind of bigger and democratic space. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited for the future. Um, so yeah, future. What's next for art galleries? I think changing commission structure, DAOs, all of these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, guys, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn my camera back on. Okay. So I hope that that gave you a good scope. Um, I will address some of the questions now. Also, I think now is a good time for you guys to um, write some questions. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, so Gazelle Art House Residency, um, it is one month long online as well it's been going on for the past six years so we started with these virtual reality exhibitions um, on an annual basis and then our founding director became very dedicated to uh, promoting and supporting digital artists so she started an online residency program where an artist would share their work from um, would share their work online on our website and uh, with that we would host like online events and talks and uh, yeah, it kind of varies each month. So this month we are actually um, showing an artist, Ana Maria Caballero, um, who did the residency uh, last year. I believe it was the first cohort. Um, and she's actually flying over to London to do a poetry reading um, 
at uh, at the gallery. So, you know, sometimes we do IRL events, sometimes we do online things, sometimes we do NFT drops. Um, so yeah, it's always just one person each month, been going on for many years. Um, and it's such a pleasure to manage because I get to just like talk to a new artist every month and learn something totally new. Um, and we have a pretty, pretty ongoing relationship with the artists afterwards. So in terms of like on a friendly basis, all artists who have exhibited um, in our like digital project space have gone through the residency. So it's like a rite of passage for us to work with an artist. Um, it's also good because we get to get to know how, how these artists work. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, have you seen evidence of any gallery succeeding in onboarding traditional collectors to the NFT space? Yes, yes. So that's a good question. Um, so, so evidence of any galleries exiting and onboarding traditional collectors to the NFT space. Um, a great example was when we were at this art fair um, in Dubai, at Art Dubai Digital, they launched like a purely digital section and uh, they, um, like literally it was just, I was like setting up like so many different crypto wallets throughout this art fair. All of these guys had just come from the like kind of um, contemporary art section. I was in the digital section. So immediately they were super engaged buying their first NFTs right at the stand. Um, so it's definitely happening. It's definitely out there. The gallery were kind of like a difficult sometimes in a difficult situation because a lot of um collectors will want us to set up their wallets for them and then buy ethereum and then we've gotten into territory where it's like you are almost being a financial advisor which is kind of stressful um so yeah so basically we have gone through that and it's been a really interesting experience um yeah i would say it happens mostly at art, art fairs is a really good space where first time buyers can like buy NFTs um, trying to think we have had a couple of like workshops with our collectors to like help them set up their wallet too as I had mentioned um, but yeah it's not like we're getting floods of our collectors wanting to enter the space there's a little bit of hesitation and a little bit of skepticism as you can imagine because the NFT space um, doesn't have the best press what about curators? Um, kind of missed them in the overviews. True. So curators, um, curators work for galleries and museums equally. There's a lot of external curators and also a lot of academics will be curators. Um, they are hugely, hugely important. We will frequently invite an external curator to curate our show and also write a text about our show. Um, extremely important in contextualizing um, the art that we're exhibiting. Um, and I think equally, you know, the, the term curator is especially used like all the time, especially in our social media age. Everyone's a curator of their Instagram feed and a curator of, everyone's a curator in their, their own right. Um, I suppose what's, what's very, um, what's, what's challenging about it is like what defines a curator I've been referred to a curator as a curator before um I would not consider myself that because in the, in the museum space you have to have a PhD to be a curator at a museum but equally that's not like you know anyone can be a curator it's kind of like anyone can be an artist but super super important within within the art world of course um and you'll get a lot of like celebrity curators and you'll also get a lot of people who claim that they're curators but kind of a like, but you still are kind of like, are they a curator or are they just like saying that, that they are? Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if that kind of answers your question a little bit, um, but super, super integral, of course. Um, what sort of financial advice to give to artists at the beginning of um, their career, like starting an LLC or working with online sales tech. 
martinres.com. I don't know this company. I can explain it if you want. Um, it's a great resource that I've used that allows mm -hmm. artists to set up a profile and sell their work um, to different people. And the way that you pay for it is you can choose a structure of monthly installments. And they also cover shipping for artists, which I think is really great. Like they pay for it themselves. Um, and which has been a really great method for me just to work as an artist and not work with other institutions and sort of be able to do it as my side, like while I have, you know, a, a job or something like that. And then um, I'm just wondering, like when you work with, when, as an artist liaison, like, do you, I know that artists sometimes aren't the most savvy financial advisors for themselves. Like, do you recommend artists, like, do you give them resources in order to like, you know, build their business in a, in a like, an intelligent way i just think this is good advice and it is yeah it's a, it's a really good question um in terms of uh, we definitely would recommend opportunities so this is where things like residencies really come in so for example our youngest represented artist hasn't actually like lived um lived back in his home and like in a really long time he's been um at like residency after residency after residency um so that's kind of like how we're managing his like younger career but that's because he's also really at an early stage and we see a lot of really good residency opportunities for him so in a way that that's kind of how we're like financially supporting him um financial wise depending on the conversations you're having with a gallery um you could also look for um and to supply like stipends that could totally be a conversation that you have if you have that kind of like open relationship um other than that i would say you know a gallery really wouldn't wouldn't like be against or would stop you from selling your artwork on any like you know sales platform including nfts and things like that um if they did like stop you from doing that then i think th there would be a different like financial arrangement going on um but i personally as like an artist liaison i don't um like discuss with the artists their financial situation i think if they were at a situation where they were like financially vulnerable they would probably go straight to the director um yeah that's that's what i that's what i imagine thank um, you yeah i hope that i hope that was helpful but equally um if you want a more like in-depth response then i can definitely like ask around my uh gallery team and yeah um so how do you understand the link between an IRL artwork and a digital version such as an NFT? Do you see galleries using NFT technology to help painters or sculptors to make royalties on secondary sales of their work? So, absolutely, um, LB, I think, like, I, I personally see loads of opportunity for um, painters and sculptors to, like, start taking on this technology for that. But um, it's like the traditional art world still isn't that bothered just yet. Like there is a little bit of a sense, um, at least in like the London scene, I'm not like I, I haven't lived, um, I haven't done like my career in the US. And I think the US is a bit more like um, a bit more forward thinking with like the NFT space. But, you know, I have to say like priority wise, galleries are not, galleries in like the art world generally are not prioritizing um you know developing technology they've always been bad with this it's pretty exhausting even like that makes sense yeah exactly and it's like the like my my partner works at christie's he works for the impressionist modern art department and i'm like do you realize what blockchain can do for your provenance like like why are they dealing with like the, the most like fragile and like illegible kind of yep. um you know backs of frames with like various stamps like you know like there's a reason like fake or, like I was watching a fake or fortune on 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 Madaliani last night and I'm like this is so ridiculous <laughs> like provenance is still this debated the blockchain yeah. will change that but this is not really in like serious conversations at this point 
you know? I'm not surprised. I just more, I'm curious what you see like the future being, you know, purely, I mean, almost theoretical. Cause I know it's these we're so early, but I just, if you know anything or if you have any feelings about it. Yeah, I do. I do really see it as the future um, blockchain, like more, more broadly, like for security and provenance and uh, For, for me right now it's, and, and royalties that's how, what I see really changing the art world um, something that I get sometimes a little bit like disappointed about is like a little bit sometimes of the lack of like interest um, in the traditional art world but uh, yeah you, you don't have many people just like jumping and going for it and like there's still a lot of like hierarchy yeah um, I also think that these like this question is going to be answered by artists because they're going to make new things that, you know, ex- like go beyond like the physical and linked with the digital in some way. So more For exciting sure. to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like we're already seeing like the, the gallery, like Gazelli has changed in its own, in its own way. And like our models have changed and adapted but we're a gallery that's already been used to like working with digital artists and taking on like new media and kind of challenging ourselves a little bit. It's like embedded in the program for your kind of standard impressionist art dealer is like who still pays his salaries to his staff in checks. Like I have no clue when they would take on blockchain for the, for their provenance, but they're still selling million dollar artworks. Um, so yes wow. then, yeah I know it's, it's pretty funny um, how can artists go about applying for Gazelio residency so if you guys want um, I can send you a little brochure um, yeah, I will ask Boya um, if I should if I should uh, send around the brochure but yeah we're always looking for new artists because they change every month so we're planning for next year right now um, it's a pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, the submission process is just kind of a, a phone call with me and um, like submitting a kind of proposal, an artist statement. Um, so yeah. Um, are a lot of really successful NFT artists being represented by a gallery these days? For sure. I mean, I think maybe less like represented, but more so like galleries just literally jumping on these artists super quickly and you'll also I mean something that was a little bit frustrating um, for us was we've been like working with digital artists and doing VR exhibitions and doing you know like immersive exhibitions for so many years and um, you know it's really like it's really hard to sell digital artworks like really hard it's like like as individual files so, but we stuck with it. We kept doing it every year because we saw it as a new medium. And then it's like, oh, NFTs are a thing. And then all these galleries are like, oh, we've done our own NFT platform. And like, now we support digital artists. And it's like, oh, how convenient. Um, so I think what we more saw was like, galleries really changing their tone with embracing digital art and new media. The moment that, the moment that kind of artists started earning quite a lot. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I've noticed. But yeah, you did so many, so many NFT and digital artists are um, getting more integrated in digital programs. Um, and then um, a, a list of residencies you'd recommend by chance or a resource of sources. Yes, we do. Um, God, there's so many residency opportunities all over the world. It was one of those things where I realized um, that I, I was like, why didn't I just become an artist? Because like you guys could just apply for, just apply to as many as you can and like see where the world will take you. There's so many great opportunities out there. Um, so I can also try and send a list. You find it hard to find good ones that don't have hidden fees. That's interesting. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of the ones that don't have fees are typically invitation only. 
Um, so the, the space will reach out, um, but keep, but I can, I can definitely have a look at a list for sure. Um, and let's try to see if we have any more questions. Do you guys have any more questions? I hope that was helpful and like made sense. <laughs> yes, it was super spectacular. I'm I'm so oh, grateful yeah, yeah. for your for, just for just your an FYI. Opinion. This is going on YouTube. Some of that probably was opinion. <laughs> um, <but> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. That was Thanks really so fun. Much. We really appreciate cool. you um, coming. I, I, um, equally, Boya, if you, of course, um, if you want to share, actually, you guys could message me on Discord. I'm not very good on Discord, though. Um, email is kind of like a little bit better. Um, but yeah, any any questions? Um, I get, if, if I put my email here. Um, that's my email if you guys have any other questions that are like more specific and oh yeah my twitter is at that's my personal one I'm also not like very um uh, ice price no it's at India price 99 um personal twitter um yeah so also you can dm me on there um, and follow me and yes and I will get back to you guys um, yeah if any any questions at all I just want to be really helpful and I hope you guys are like way less intimidated by galleries and I hope that you embrace it the art world and they embrace you and hopefully like through the next 10 years we're going to see dramatic change of um, how we approach digital art and digital artists and the gallery world the art world generally will be it's kind of open and exciting um yeah 